So welcome to the HPC Best Practices uh, webinar series, which is brought to you by the Ideas Productivity Project, uh, which is part of the Scale Computing Project of the United States Department of Energy. The series is a collaboration involving the computing facilities at Argonne, Oak Ridge, and Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratories. I'm Osni Marquez from Lawrence Berkeley, Ashley Barker from Oak Ridge, and I will be the hosts for today's webinar, Extreme Scale Scientific Software Stack. E4S. The webinar will be presented by Samir Shendi and David uh, Honiger Rogers. Samir has worked on the development of the Tau Performance System, the Program Database Toolkit PDT, the Extreme Scale Scientific Software E4S, and the HPC Linux distribution. His research interests include tools and techniques for performance instrumentation, measurement, analysis, runtime systems. HPC container runtimes, scientific software stacks, and compiler optimizations. He's a research associate professor at the director of the Performance Research Laboratory at the University of Oregon. David is team lead for the data science at scale, uh, uh, data scientist scale team at Los Alamos National Laboratory. He focuses on iterative analysis tools that integrate design, scalable analytics, and principles of cognitive, cognitive science to promote scientific discovery. Prior to work on large scale data analysis, David worked at DreamWorks, feature animation, writing and managing production software. He has degrees in computer science architecture uh, and a master of fine arts in writing for children. We have issued more than 200 tickets for this webinar and all attendees have been muted. We'll be receiving questions through the Zoom chat and also the Google doc, I'll paste those links uh, in the chat. Uh, uh, the webinar will have a break so the speaker can respond to the questions that come in. With that, Samir, please. Thank you very much, Asni, and thank you for inviting me to give this uh, webinar. Uh, so the extreme scale scientific software stack tries to respond to this key challenge and that challenge is that as our software gets more complex, it's getting harder and harder to install tools, libraries correctly in an integrated and interoperable software stack. To, to address this issue, the extreme scale scientific software stack uh, is a curated SPAC based software distribution. We use the SPAC package manager and then we have several components and I'll spend some time describing many of these components. So we have a SPAC binary build cache for bare metal installs. If you have an HPC system, which is comprised of x86-64 or the IBM PPC-64 LE or even the ARM-64 AR-64 architecture, then you can download packages from the E4S SPAC build cache and these are pre-built binaries of ECP ST products and various E4S products. You can also get container images. You know, containers are being used a lot now for reproducible workflows. We have container images on Docker Hub and the E4S web page. And what's interesting about these images is that we have base images which you can use to create your own custom image as well as we have full featured containers and all of these containers come with GPU support. So for instance, if you were using an IBM image, you will have support for the, the NVIDIA V100 GPUs. So you could launch it on one of the HPC platforms and you'll have a complete stack of uh, packages. You can uh, refer to our GitHub recipes for creating custom images from the base images. So you can just add or delete some of those packages and create your optimized image, which has support for GPUs. And then we have, of course, GitLab integration for building these images. We have a validation test suite on GitHub. And this validation test suite goes one step further than just installing the packages. It checks that you can actually build an application with the libraries that are installed in the image. It runs the package uh, example and then verifies that the output is correct. So you get a curated uh, set of packages that you can rely on. 
we also have a virtual box image for those who are trying to uh, learn more about container runtimes. And these container runtimes include Docker, Singularity, Shifter, and Charlie Cloud. And we also have E4S images that are now deployed on commercial cloud platforms. And we already have support for AWS and the Google Cloud platform. And we are evaluating and uh, looking at the Microsoft Azure platform next. You can learn more about E4S from our webpage, the e4s.io. So as I said, it's a SPAC based dist distribution. And I'll go a little bit more in details on what that entails. Uh, we've had several uh, releases and these are based on the software distribution kits or SDKs of different areas. And uh, we have gone from an October 2018 release of E4S 0.1, which had 24 full release products, all the way now to E4S version 1.2, which was released in November at Supercomputing 2020, uh, which has support for both x86-64 as well as PPC-64 LE platforms with 67 full release products. And uh, I mentioned about SPAC. We use SPAC because it's a flexible package manager. To use SPAC, all you need to do is just do a Git clone on their SPAC repo and source this setup script. And then you are ready to install a package. You can choose the compilers. You can choose the versions. If I wanted to install Tau and all its dependencies, all I have to say is SPAC install Tau. But unlike other package managers, SPAC understands which version uh, uh, to use and allows you to specify different versions and configurations. You can also specify uh, details about the package dependencies. So here is an unconstrained install of the Tau package. I can say Tau, please install Tau, but install version 2.29. So it understands a custom version using the percent uh, at symbol. And then with the percentage symbol, SPAC understands compilers. So you can say SPAC compiler find and it will find all the compilers on your system. Then you can choose and say, I wanna use GCC version 730 and then you can use that to install Tau. You can also have different configurations of the same package and the same version installed in different directories. Here I can say, Please install Tau, but enable variants of uh, build options such as MPI, Python, pthread, or level zero, or OpenCL, or, or Rockum, so that it understands the GPU support. You can say, I want to use MPI, but I want MVAPH2 version 2.3, which is built without the wrapper R path. Tilda means without. So you can specify dependency information about specific runtimes and MVAPH provides the MPI uh, capability in this case. So you can go fairly deep and this is the, the flexibility of SPAC, which is critical for building the entire software stack. So once you install our container, you can also say SPAC find and it will show you all the packages, like here I can see that it's a Trilinos version 13.0.0 that is installed in the package. And you can see all the other dependencies and other packages that are installed. All versions can coexist. Multiple versions of the same package are also okay. And then packages are installed to automatically correct, uh, find the correct dependency information. So if I say spac load minus r Trilinos, it will not only load Trilinos, it will load all the other packages that Trilinos depends on. And then the binaries will work regardless of the user's environment. Also a plus with using SPAC is that it automatically generates module files. We are all familiar with modules on HPC systems. So you don't, uh, while you don't need to use them, they are available to provide a, a good interface. In fact, on all our machines uh, at the University of Oregon on the Frank system, we have SPAC installed packages of the E4S stack and then modules created by the SPAC environment are shown to, uh, to all the users. So they can just pick with the regular module interface as well as the SPAC interface. 
So SPAC simplifies HPC software deployment for users, developers, cluster installations, and it's the central, it is central to ECP's software strategy. If you have an ECP product, uh, we strongly encourage you to use SPAC to make it available to the broader HPC community. And uh, you can visit the SPAC.io webpage to learn more about it and, uh, and see how it's being used in uh, ECP. Hey, Samir, questions? Uh, there is a question? Yes. It's interesting to see a Arch 64 being supported. This goes back a few, a few slides. Are, yes. there any, are there any plans for ARM 64 based supercomputers in the US getting unveiled soon? So, you know, we already have a, a system at Sandia National Labs based on ARM 64. And, uh, you know, our partners uh, in Riken in Japan also have the Fugaku, the number one uh, HPC system on the top 500 list currently, which is based on the Fujitsu A A64 FX chip. So uh, we want to make sure that E4S runs across a broad range of platforms, which includes x86-64 based systems, the IBM PPC-64 LE based systems, uh, like the Summit and Sierra, as well as ARM64. And in the next few years, you will be seeing more and more uh, images coming from the E4S project that support this. Even now, we do have support in E4S on images that are posted to Docker Hub, which support ARM64 as, uh, as well as GPUs, like uh, the NVIDIA GPUs working with ARM64. And there are some projects uh, uh, that have begun using this already. Okay, Does that so help answer the question. Right. Yeah. Another question: Which module infrastructure does SPAC use, LMOD or environment modules or both? So both. It supports both, but uh, uh, most of the users prefer to use LMOD, which is more recent. It's more robust. So uh, if you have an environment modules based system, you can use the the tickle based uh, configurations from SPAC uh, out of the box. All right, there are questions coming here. Samir, Samir, I don't, uh, okay, so a uh, uh, participant wrote, I don't see the list, I don't see, I don't see the list of packages, things like BLAS and LAPAC. Do I, I miss go back to the next slide? <laughs> ah, okay, good. All right, so <laughs> yeah, go on, Samir. There is another question being typed, but please continue. Okay, so uh, here is the container image of uh, uh, E4S version 1.2, you can download it directly from Docker Hub by doing a Docker pull on this. It will know which platform to use, or you can download from here for x86-64 uh, and PPC-64 LE. And we support both CUDA and Rockham in the x86-64 version. Here is the list of packages that you were asking about. I mentioned earlier that we have 67 full products and uh, not only the E4S uh, products, we also have support for AI and ML packages that support, for instance, TensorFlow 235 or PyTorch 1.8 or Horoward, which uses MPI with these uh, frameworks. So we have a very strong AI ML uh, set of packages that are available and they support AMD, Rockham, as well as NVIDIA CUDA and multiple versions. We also have Cocos in the image with support for AMD GPUs. So you can use it directly on a AMD system and uh, use Cocos to express parallelism inherent in your application. Here are examples of uh, the packages that are there. In fact, yesterday we had a hackathon and we were showing how we use Raja with support for both CUDA as well as uh, AMD GPUs on our our systems. Here is the 67 packages for x86-64. You can see that they are in unique directories with the version numbers and uh, a full list of packages, including say Sundials, Trilinos, Umpire. And this is for x86-64. Now we also have singularity containers. So you can just download a single image and then it will have the different runtimes from the vendors. And this may be a good way for for HPC system uh, you know, administrators to install a single file and provide access to all of the 67 
packages and the AI stacks for a complete uh, HPC system. And then all you have to do is say singularity exec on that file. And then you will have SPAC in your path. You will have the AI ML packages in your path. And it's available for x86-64 right now and also PPC-64 LE. And uh, we also have, uh, uh, you know, uh, these images on Docker Hub. So if you go to Docker Hub uh, to this site, you will see all the 67 products for uh, for the E4S, and you can see the different tags. We also have tags which are uh, labeled by by the date, and and now we have of course 2020 uh, with the December tags and all. So. We have a lot of these releases uh, on the Docker Hub that you can download, and and of course the curated main release of uh, E4S. Here are the list of packages that are available for PPC64 LE. As you can see, this list of uh, PPC64 LE, all the way to 67 of these packages, and these slides will be available to you, so you can look at the details and you can download this container of singularity and just launch singularity with this to run the the image now i would recommend that you use the dash dash nv flag if you are planning to use the the v100 gpus with the the image so that you can access the nvidia libraries that get loaded from your host machine into the image as you run the e4s uh, stack and here is an example. I say singularity exec with the dash dash nv flag. And then I say Python, and then I can load TensorFlow, PyTorch, CV2, Matplotlib, NumPy. I can even say TensorFlow test is the GPU available. And it will show me all the four GPUs like this. And here are the base container images. Now, what is interesting about this is that if you use a UBI based image, universal binary interface, it comes from Red Hat. And if your image is based on the E4S UBI image and you create your custom image with adding some packages an optimized image, then the support of Red Hat extends to the UBI image if this image is deployed on a Red Hat system. So most of our HPC centers do use Red Hat as the OS uh, of choice. So the container and your applications do get the support of Red Hat uh, in some way for the, the OS support extending to the containers if they are using the UBI base image. And here are recipes that we have on Docker Hub uh, as, and the, uh, sorry, on GitHub where we have these container recipes for different OSs. And you can see how we can copy in a spac.yaml file and use the environment and uh, install using the build cache. So we don't have to compile everything from the source code. We can just say spac clean and then we have a Docker file. And then this Docker file is used by this build.sh script. All of these are documented in these reproducible Docker recipes, which are there for these platforms. So you can build the packages and then you can change the spac.yaml file. Now here is the full uh, list of packages that we are using for creating the containers. But if you wanted to just cherry pick a few of these packages and say, I'm gonna create a custom container. I don't need all of these packages. I just need six of these. Then you could just put those six in here, specify uh, additional flags like in this case, I'm saying, I want to use Python 373 with this, or I want to use Trilinos, this version with DTK, Interpret2, and shards. And then you can just build it by just launching it. So we have created most of the infrastructure you need. You just have to clone this repo, edit the file, and you are already on your way to building a custom container that you can then use for your optimized workflow. You can have a bare metal install as well. So if you don't want to create a container, you can use this recipe and just say spac-environment dot, it will pick the spac.yaml file and install the packages. 
So you can do an HPC bare metal install or use the Docker-based creation of the packages. So both modes are available. And to speed up the install of these packages, we have a build cache. Now we have tried to use uh, different compiler versions which are commonly used in HPC workflows like GCC 8.3.1, 8 GCC 930, 750, and for different architectures. And we have created binaries so that you don't have to wait for all the dependencies to be built. And now we have uh, on this build cache, the E4S uh, uh, build cache, we have over 27,000 SPAC binaries for different architectures, for different operating systems like this. So you can choose whether you prefer Ubuntu or Red Hat or, or on one of these platforms and, and pick this key and uh, you will be able to add the mirror to your SPAC uh, workflow and trust this uh, public key and uh, you're on your way to creating a binary install of your package. This is used for uh, e uh, ECP applications already. Here is an example from the WDM app where we say install this e4s.pub and uh, trust it and add the e4s mirror and build it really fast. And uh, David will later uh, discuss how it's being used in the Pantheon project for the, uh, for the Pantheon workflows. Now, uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, it's a curated release. And one of the important things about a curated release is that we want to make sure that the packages that are installed work correctly. So we have some test cases, the validation test cases. And these sweep across all 67 packages after they are installed to validate that what was installed works correctly. And in these cases, we often rely on examples that are part of the test cases shipping with the package. And here is an example of Magma, where we have an example, we build it with MPI compilers, we'll run it and give a pass fail indication for the validation test. And this is in supplement to the SPAC test framework. And we highly recommend that all of you update your SPAC recipes to add the test uh, function and then specify how your application should be tested. And in fact, it, the SPAC test framework goes one step further where it picks up the examples from the specific release of that package and does not need to rely on static examples like in the case of the E4S test suite. But with both of these things in play, it gives you greater confidence that the package was installed correctly and, and uh, use that to create a full stack. Now we have uh, base images, as I mentioned, and the container builds where you have these Docker files and recipes, and uh, you can create these images using GCC with uh, mpitch configured for mpitch ABI replacement so that you can then substitute the MPI in the application binary with the system MPI. And we are working on a, a project that I'll, I'll mention about this. We also have an extensive infrastructure for creating uh, these binaries and GitLab runner images are, are uh, uh, used. We have these base images for, for uh, running our GitLab workflows and they are available on Docker Hub. We have an extensive list of images. This is just for PPC 64 LE and you can see the, the checkouts like, like this for Red Hat 7, there were 3,800 checkouts for the runner image. Here is the GitLab instance running at the University of Oregon building packages automatically for all of these different runtimes, uh, operating systems for two different architectures right now in these build pipelines. And you can see that all of these passed the, the builds and this is at gitlab.e4s.io, this pipeline running at the University of Oregon. We also have multi-stage E4S uh, continuous integration build pipelines on the facilities. Here is a build pipeline running on Cori at NERSC. And you can see the pipelines from NERSC. 
at software.nurse.gov with ECP E4S pipelines. And we have built pipelines uh, running at Oak Ridge National Labs. Here is the pipeline on ascent at Oak Ridge. And we have reproducible container builds. Now we have a number of these packages and we want to provide a single location for accurate product information for all of these ECP software products. And uh, we have a doc portal. And this doc portal uh, allows you to specify which files from your repository are shown on our doc portal website. And we have a way to rake this information every night. So we have the most current information about the products shown on the e4s.io doc portal webpage. And you get to control what information gets displayed on the web page. So there are uh, tools for raking this information and uh, the summaries are published like this where you can just click the plus button and you can get detailed information about the Amrex and what it does. And this is uh, 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 an image from the, the doc portal out of the E4S page. We also have community policies that you should view on what it takes to join the E4S uh, set of products. We have the doc portal and we have a join button where you, if you are not part of the E4S uh, list of products, you can join this, uh, uh, this ecosystem. I mentioned about the virtual box image that we have, which supports all four HPC container runtimes, including Docker, Shifter, Singularity, and Charlie Cloud. You can download this virtual box image and run it right on your laptops. Now, if your application is built in the container using the MPEGs that supplied with the containers, you can substitute that MPI using the MPEG ABI compatibility layer. And the same binary can be launched, not just on your laptop, but also on an HPC system using this MPEG ABI compatibility layer using a package called the E4S container launch. It's a tool to simplify the launch of E4S containers and uh, uh, it simplifies the launch and MPI replacement. We currently have support for MPH ABI, but we are also currently looking at support for open MPI. And in some cases, the open MPI version must match precisely with the major and minor versions. We are also looking at how we can use PMIX to do the translation of MPI calls. And it's a very interesting project, uh, which is uh, what we hope to use to launch MPI jobs. And this is the architecture of the E4S container launch system. So in summary, I would like to distinguish what E4S is and what it is not. So it is not a closed system for taking contributions only from DOE software development teams, which creates a monolithic take it or leave it software behemoth. Rather, it's an extensible open architecture software ecosystem that accepts contributions from US as well as international teams. It, you should think of it as a framework, a framework for collaborative open source product integration and a full collection of compatible curated software uh, releases and capabilities and a manifest of selectable software capabilities where you can create your own software stack based on base images that come from E4S. It's a vehicle for delivering high quality reusable software products in collaboration with others. It is not a commercial product. And it's not just a simple packaging of existing software, but you should think of E4S as a conduit, a conduit for future leading edge HPC software targeting the scalable next generation computing platforms that are deployed now and are coming in the future and a hierarchical software framework to enhance using SDKs, the software interoperability and quality expectations. We have work to do, a lot of work to do as we improve the support for GPUs, visualization tools. Soon you will see an E4S release based on not just the CUDA and uh, Rockum, but also one API from Intel. We have work to do with DOE LLVM as we merge many efforts from LLVM and uh, do more work in the area of facility deployment, continuous integration, scalable startup of full 
featured super containers and improved the launch of MPI applications and have both support for from source builds as well as binary build caches. You can download all these images and learn more about it from our webpage e4s.io. A lot of our work goes on at the Performance Research Laboratory at the University of Oregon. Uh, we have a very active uh, visitor program. Do please come after COVID-19, of, of course, to come and visit us at the University of Oregon and participate in our hackathons. I would like to thank the Exascale Computing Project for their sponsorship of the E4S project. Uh, any other questions before we switch? Yes, Samir, there are some questions here for you. I don't want to penalize David's uh, part, though. But uh, okay, do you see? We can get to that uh, later, uh, if you would like. Yeah, to. I mean, I can, I can adjust my time. I, why don't you take a few and? Okay, Samir, can you see the questions, or should I? Some of the questions have already been answered here, but there are some open questions. Could uh, sh sh I, sure? I, for I, example, yeah. this one. <laughs> yes, the X eighty six architecture. So, so we do have uh, images made for x86-64 that should work for many different uh, targets. And uh, we are also creating custom images next. And we have, for example, the Cooper Lake system. And uh, uh, we have uh, custom images are So we are targeting many different platforms. x86-64 images will run on all of the machines, but as you know, uh, you can also create with SPAC, a target can be specified. You can say target equals and a specific machine uh, architecture. So, so, so go ahead. No, I was gonna say, if you scroll down, there is an, a question about GPUs. Yes. Uh, are there any licensing issues which include CUDA runtime libraries in the E4S? Uh, no, oh, there is. That's right. The CUDA runtime libraries can be freely redistributed. We also have support for Rockham, which is available through SPAC or directly through our images. And our next release will have Intel One API and Intel compilers and uh, Intel uh, MPI with DPC. Uh, as well. So you see next, are there plans to, uh, can you spec place the download container uh, and go from there? In a shared environment module cache or must each user of a given module replicate the downloaded container in this own environment. So we have deployed E4S containers uh, facility wide. For example, with shifter, you can have a single uh, instance of E4S that can be shared across multiple users. They can all target the same E4S container while having their own files in their own file systems that are mounted within the image of the container as it is launched on the HPC backend nodes. So you can do that with shifter, with singularity, and you can have a single location uh, where we have these images that are residing on, on machines like Theta or Cori or uh, Summit. And, and of course, if you want to download it in your own area, you're free to do that. You can also create your own image with Singularity. You can point to a Docker Hub instance and say Singularity build with that Docker Hub uh, repository and create your own uh, download. You can tweak that image, you can add to it you can create your own custom images like I showed. So are there plans to support Intel GPUs and other parts? Absolutely. And you should see that uh, image. I already have an image here and you can see uh, there's a singularity exact image. We'll be doing some more testing on this before we release it. But if you want to get early access to this image, you can go to Docker Hub already in our page and look for the December 8th image. And it has uh, one API in it already. And how is SPAC and other container different from VirtualBox? So, you know, with uh, SPAC is a package manager. SPAC allows you to install packages. You can use VirtualBox to launch an image where you have a separate kernel running inside that image. With containers, with Docker, Singularity, Shifter, there is only one 
kernel running with virtualization approaches like virtual box you have two kernels and the overhead of a second kernel in a completely different image so with the same kernel you can deploy multiple oss you can use the same kernel to work across multiple images and uh, can i install os on spec no you do not you it's the other way around you know within an operating system you use the spec as the package manager so instead of using yum or you instead of using app get that you are familiar with you will use spec to install your packages does that make sense plans for build with more recent compilers yes absolutely we are building with the latest compilers in fact this image that i am pointing with pointing to it uses intel 2021 compilers and it supports intel gpus as well so with this uh, uh, latest llvm is also included we have llvm 11 and 12 support right now so uh, uh, with each release of the container you will find newer compilers newer run times and a whole new set of packages so many of the packages that i showed in the list will be refreshed whenever we do a next release of e4s 1.3 Sounds good. Thank you, Samir. Um, well, for the participants, we will ask the uh, Samir and David to go through the questions after the webinar and to do some cleaning. So this will be in a nicer <laughs> shape later. With that, David, could you please? <clears throat> sure. Um, let me see here. All right. I'm going to share my desktop in case there are questions that I want to. Um, show you some other details though. So can you see everything? Yep. Okay. Okay, so um, yeah, thanks Samir. And uh, thanks for the opportunity to talk to you guys today. Um, you know, we've, we've had a lot of fun working with Samir over the past year um, and uh, taking advantage of some of the cool stuff that he was talking about. Um, oops, um, here we go. So what I'm gonna talk to you today about is uh, the, uh, the Pantheon project, and I'll get into detail in case you haven't uh, heard of Pantheon yet, and um, how we've been working with E4S to support end-to-end -end example workflows for ECP. Um, you know, at a high level, um, we know that the ECP, uh, you know, the project is complex because there's a lot of things that have to work together. Um, and so the Pantheon project um, started out by saying, hey, there's this outstanding need to uh, capture and curate workflows across all the boundaries, across um, applications, uh, institute technologies, things like that. And so we've been collaborating, um, you know, we started off with that, that desire to do, um, to do that work. And then we've been collaborating with E4S um, to advance this integration. Um, I'll talk to you about what that means in detail, but basically the high level contributions of the work that we've been doing together are um, we have these curated end-to-end -end application in situ analysis examples. Uh, they can be run by people who have uh, accounts on Summit and there is a, a, a GitHub repository of these examples. And um, the real benefit that's happened for us is that um, from the Pantheon project perspective, because we've been using E4S and we've been using the cached builds, our um, integration speeds and our iteration speeds on these workflows has just been sped up just by orders of magnitude. Um, in practice, we say, you know, there's a 10x speed up if you're trying to build something from scratch, or, or you know, that's the numbers that we get when we do timings. But in practice, it's actually, I would, I would add another order of magnitude to that. If you've ever built anything by yourself, you know, running your own build scripts and make scripts and things like that, um, you know, when those things get optimized, that that things speed up measurably. So you know, we've gone. It's hard to remember actually, but back in uh, August before we started really working uh, with the E4S team, you know, it might take us a day to to build or rebuild an end-to-end -end workflow just to get the binaries in place before we could actually run it. Um, and that was due to all, a number of, of, of problems, but basically, you know, running out of allocation time for the build, just all kinds of issues that would run into. Um, but basically now we can, we can download and uh, run with the E4S cache uh, binaries in a matter of minutes. And it's just, it's just totally changed the face of the work that we've done. 
Um, so also working with A4S has promoted um, progress for us on uh, reproducibility and usability. So if we have a workflow and we want it to be reproducible, um, we've got to do things like isolate builds and target things to uh, specific tasks and metrics. And because of the work that, that Samir described, um, we have a much better shot at reproducibility, even though th these things are still very complex. Um, in terms of usability, as I said, um, before when we would we would create one of these workflows from scratch, it could take hours um, to, to build these things and run them. And as I said, we reduced that to a number of minutes. Uh, so practically speaking, it means that not only people on the team, but someone that we might um, direct to this and say, hey, take a look at that workflow, or if somebody wants to just experiment with this, it takes it from something that they you know, can do in, in, in a matter of minutes to something that they might just give up on because it's just too complicated. So in terms of usability, this has been critical uh, to, to what we're doing. Um, also in terms of uh, usability, we try to make these uh, workflows as self-documenting as possible. So you can imagine if we have a workflow that spans across an application and an in-situ algorithm, um, just explaining that could be quite complex. Um, and so just as a project, um, we've made these things as simple as we can with the idea that someone could um, download one of these workflows and start with the execute script. And I'll, I'll show you this in detail, but um, basically be able to work through kind of what the system is doing and what is needed to run one of these workflows just by looking at the code. Okay, so what is a Pantheon workflow? Um, so the project vision was really, just, as I said, you know, there's, these things are complex if you want to integrate across uh, project boundaries. So what we wanted to do is provide uh, a place that you might um, uh, record a milestone. Say if you had something that you'd done for, for a project and you wanted to say, hey, this worked and I want to uh, retain it. Um, there's examples here. So if you can say, hey, how, do you, how, do you, how does one run a Nix uh, simulation to uh, you know, do a sampling and create a cinema database. Well, there might be an example of that um, in the Pantheon project. And also just reproducibility. So if somebody's starting and they want, want to do some research into uh, maybe an analysis technique for something like Nix or SW4, there might be an example that someone could start with. Um, so th those are the reasons that we want to, to do this project. Um, I'll note that we do have states for these workflows. And you can imagine that, um, you know, you might want to release something and say to people, hey, this is a workflow that um, is an example. It works pretty well. I'm not going to guarantee you that it's going to run a year from now, but I'm recording this example so you could take a look at it if you wanted to learn from it. Um, you know, and then you could have all the way to something like, hey, we will guarantee that this is going to work for you on this platform and under these conditions. And we're going to do what it takes to keep that in, in, in a release mode. And that's a very different, um, you know, that's a very different kind of release. Uh, so we have within the project these notions of states of, of kind of what you're willing to release out in the world so people know what to expect from it. Um, there is a repository for examples um, specifically with E4S integration, um, and this is the URL for it. Um, I'm going to go through some of the examples of end to end uh, pipelines that we have uh, so that you can kind of see exactly what's out there. Okay. Um, these things are actually pretty easy to run. Uh, once you download the repository, it's really just a matter of cloning the submodules, uh, filling out a few uh, variables so that, for example, the script will know where you want to, uh, uh, where you consider to be a working directory, and then you know what your compute allocation is and things like that. So we don't keep any of that kind of information in this kind of script. But once you've done that, you just execute it and um, depending on your settings, it's either going to pull down the E4S uh, binaries caches or uh, build something from scratch. And then it'll uh, run an example, wait for that to complete, do some post-processing, and then do some validation. Uh, so that's it's pretty straightforward. OK, so what uh, are the workflows of interest to us? So from, a, from an ECP perspective and also from a, a project perspective, you know, we're interested in workflows that cross product boundaries. So uh, something, you know, like I said, that would take an application, uh, run some kind of in-situ analysis on it, um, run the simulation itself, get some results, and maybe do a post-processing analysis as well. Um, there's plenty of test cases that can be embodied in things like this. 
um, you know, I want to do this kind of sampling on on this uh, um, application, and I want to see if the results match up with something. You know, you can imagine a whole bunch of things, and then some things that embody tasks. For example, in in the case that I'll show you today, um, we want to create some cinema. Um, databases as output so that we can um, look at things quickly using images. So those are the kinds of things that that we do. Um, because of the scope of the project, uh, we've been po uh, focusing on post-processing visualization with Cinema, and I'll show you that really quickly. Um, I think this is, I guess the one thing here is that because of the end-to-end -end nature of what we've done, you know, we, we do run into things that um, that other projects might not. Um, we ran into a rendering artifact in a scent that reported to the team that they were already aware of it, but it's now fixed. Um, there's a SPAC feature request that we're an advocate for, which is uh, being able to um, actually pull specific commits of repositories. And this would help us to do things like lock down the right kind of versions that we'd like. And um, there's also a runtime error that we've been um, that we were instrumental in kind of uncovering that's still under review and we don't know exactly what the resolution of that. But the point is that because you run things across boundaries, um, you're able to, you, you run into things that, that you wouldn't if you're just kind of uh, staying within your own project. So for those of you who don't know uh, what Cinema is, um, Cinema is an ECP project, which is an, a type of uh, output and a way of exploring artifacts from extreme scale uh, scientific data. It fits into this overall um, you know, in situ, in situ analysis diagram we have uh, for ECP where applications can hook up to a bunch of capabilities, uh, put different kinds of artifacts and then look at them with different tools. Uh, in particular, if you haven't heard of Cinema before, it's, a, uh, it's part of an integrated workflow where you can extract um, artifacts from extreme scale uh, data, sci scientific data. Uh, people most, most uh, often think of it as a way of capturing images uh, from these extreme, extreme scale simulations, but there's a lot of other things you can do with it. Um, if you do capture these, extreme, these images from the uh, extreme scale um, simulations, you can do things like scroll through images very quickly, like as you see here. So instead of loading up the entire data set and exploring it that way, you can explore it through uh, scrolling through images. This allows you to do things very quickly. Um, also, you can do comparative visualizations with things like, you know, if you want to run different ways that the simulations, um, you know, use different parameters to create different types of output, um, you can create images from that and then explore these things side by side very quickly too. So that's another thing that cin Cinema affords you. Okay, so. Um, here are some examples of things that are actually out there that include both E4S and, and post-processing with Cinema. So um, one of the first, the, the sim, we tried to do some things that are kind of basic so that we can start from, um, you know, if we have a workflow, you might be able to run it on different architectures um, and, and transfer it easily. So this is a very simple one, which um, basically uses Ascent, which is the um, in situ analysis and visualization capability for ECP. Um, it's a library of things that you can do for both viz and analysis. Um, and they include some mini applications that you can use. Uh, so one of the workflows basically uh, creates that, runs a, a Cloverleaf a simulation, outputs a cinema database on disk, and then verifies that that, sim that cinema database um, has, has been created correctly. Um, this is one of the first ones that we got working with the E4S caches. And this is where we really understood the power of what uh, E4S can bring to something like this. Because as I said, we went from uh, hours of build time and runtime to, to minutes. Um, and this allows, you know, just drastically speeding up the iteration time if you want to change something in the simulation and rerun it. Um, just in terms of running different settings, if you don't have to recompile, it just it speeds things up uh, amazingly. Um, we have a, another workflow, which is um, using the open source um, simulation Nix, which is a cosmology simulation. And this basically does the same thing, where it will um, uh, download the dependencies, build, um, and use the E4S cache to build some of the dependencies, uh, build the Nix simulation code, 
this actually runs an ascent sampling algorithm, and you can see that in the output if you look at it in the um, in uh, GitHub. And then from that sampling out, sampled output, it will run a visualization algorithm, uh, dump a cinema database on disk, package it up so you can look at it with a um, a cinema browser. Um, so that's actually another one that we have out there right now. Um, there's plenty that we have that are kind of in development that we haven't released yet. Um, this one is the same kind of Nix, uh, or it has the same components, but instead of, uh, but actually takes advantage of CUDA in order to do things um, on the GPU. Um, so that's an example out there as well. Um, we have worked with SW4 um, to do basically the same kind of output, except this um, does run a cinema algorithm on the database. Um, the thing that, that this adds is that once the images are, are on disk, um, you can look at the output um, in image space and do feature detection and things like that, um, regardless of the scientific domain. So this workflow actually does that and then runs, um, installs a cinema viewer so that you can look at the results, okay? All right, so that's really quick. I think um, I can, I'm leaving time for questions, but um, you can contact me if you have more questions about the work we've done either with E4S or what Pantheon's all about. Either contact me directly or Pantheon at LANL. And again, it's been, it's been really, um, for us, um, working with E4S has taken kind of the work that we wanna do in reproducible workflows for ECP from kind of this thing that, that only the team can work on and we have to, you know, hand, hand uh, you know, just monitor everything so that it actually works. Um, integrating E4S and the caches has really pulled it into something that like we can say, you can run this and, and, and other people can participate in it. It's been fantastic for the work that we've done. So uh, with that, I'll conclude and see if there are any questions about um, either this project or how we integrate with E4S. Yes, David, there are a couple of questions for you. Do you see the question or would you like me to read them? Um, let me get to the, <laughs> uh, I probably can see them here. If it's helpful, David, they're the very last two at the bottom of the document, it looks like. Okay, so I'm sorry, can you show the document? I don't have it up. I can get there, or how about we just read, read them to you? Yeah, go ahead and read them, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's fine. It just may go faster that way. Yeah. Um, so the first one is, uh, it looks like it's in reference to slide four possibly. And it says, can you elaborate on isolate builds? In what sense is a given fixed tag container image subject to variation of dependencies? Yeah, that's a good question. So this is kind of a moving target. I mean, it's not as we, so we are starting to look at um, the containers that Samir was talking about. Um, so if you really want to isolate things, you have to have a container, right? Um, because then you can control everything. Um, we are kind of uh, in the SPAC sense, we're saying um, here are the dependencies that we know about. And so if safe, uh, if I assent, for example, is something that we depend on. So, so whatever assent has codified in their SPAC builds um, is kind of what we can pin, right? So anything that's kind of outside that, if the, I don't know, if, if say we're working on, we've really targeted Summit just because of the scope for ECP. Um, so, you know, we are, we are dependent on if, if some, Summit suddenly says this compiler is not available, then, you know, that's not going to work. Um, but most of that stuff is actually captured in the SPAC, um, in the SPAC packages for the dependent things that we're using. Um, before we started using E4S and, and SPAC, we were limited to our own make files, which, you know, good luck pinning things then. Um, so we are, we are, you know, because of the scope, I would say we're, we're subject to what I would say is a reasonable window of working on Summit. Um, now we are trying to move to the container model, which will allow us to just completely control everything. Um, so I hope that answers that question. Um, and we do actually tag you know, we can tag specific versions of say Ascent or Nix or things like that. And we do that, if an application has a SPAC build, it's much easier, but sometimes they don't have SPAC builds. So for example, um, in the Nix example that I showed you, we actually pull a specific commit outside of SPAC 
um, but we know exactly that that commit is going to work uh, relative to the other things we have there. Okay, so I hope that answers that question. And then should I go to the next one? Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, yeah, how, is Pantheon considered a CI/CD suite? How easy is it to use compared to say GitHub Action or Travis CI? Can it be run on a development workstation too, or only on Summit? Yeah. So good questions. Um, so what I would say is, um, so the vision for Pantheon was, hey, let's just capture this stuff right now and get it out there so we can have conversations about it. Um, so now we have examples where we can say, hey, here's the end-to-end -end workflow that does something. Um, so our, our, our big vision was just to get that kind of, that product out there, capture the knowledge, capture the examples. Um, so, you know, I wouldn't say that we're a, a CI suite. We could be used as, as an example for a CI system, right? And that's kind of where we're looking right now to say, okay, we have this example. Um, what what do people find useful? What things could we test? What metrics could we um, could we capture so that maybe you could put it into a CI system and say, here's a complex example um, that we want to be kind of chug away every day or something like that. So I would say we're an example for a CI system. Um, and I think that answers the Travis question as well, because al although we have been trying to, um, we have been looking at, could we run, um, could we run our examples through Travis uh, CI? And probably we could, there would be some things that we couldn't um, explore such as uh, job submission systems and things like that. Um, and then the question, can Pantheon be run in a development workstation or only on Summit? So at the moment we are targeting Summit and uh, that would be the answer to that. It's just, it's really, now having said that, I would argue that um, you could take the workflow and because it captures a set of information, which is how does something work together to take the application, the in situ uh, algorithms and the output, how do those work together? Um, if you wanted to do it on your own workstation, you know, you might have a shot, but there are limitations such as uh, the type of shell, uh, things like that, which really are, are biased towards Summit. The reason for that is, um, you know, I mentioned uh, uh, usability and readability and understandability. Um, uh, usability. These systems that that are run everywhere have, in my opinion, you know, they tend to have such a complicated sh uh, shell structure that unless you're an expert, it's hard to go in and look at those scripts and see what's happening. Um, because we're targeting a specific thing. Um, you know, you can actually read them because there's not a lot of, uh, if you understand shell programming, there's some variables and things, but there's not a lot of complex substitutions and things like that uh, to run on all systems. So although you can't take it today and, you know, run it on your, your, your own workstation, um, I would argue that it, it's, it can serve as a documentation of, of what you would do if you wanted to run it on your own system. Um, so. I think that's the answer to that question. Anything else? No, I think we have covered uh, everything here. So again, uh, the participants will ask the presenters to go through the Q&A and uh, uh, do some cleaning there. Uh, thank you, Samir and David, for your presenting today in this uh, webinar series. I'll uh, take the opportunity here to share my screen. Um, to announce the next webinar in the series that's going to be on February the 10th, Good Practices for Research Software Documentation. And it's going to be presented by Stefan Druscat from the Friedrich Schiller University in Germany and Sorel Harriet from Leeds Trinity University in the United Kingdom. So we'd like to improve this series. Please uh, give us feedback. There is this link to the survey for this uh, today's webinar. These slides and recording will be available um, in the next few days. And uh, those two addresses that you see there, we'll be sending an email to folks who uh, registered um, for this uh, webinar. To, uh, the email will con contain uh, those links and, and other information. 
So thank you very much. Thank you again, Samir and David. Thank you all for joining us today and I hope to see you uh, in February. Ashley, anything you'd like to add? <laughs> I'd like to add that we have a, a bi-weekly office hours on Zoom. If you have any questions on E4S or SPAC, please, you're welcome to join us. Thank you. Hey, Samir, how would they, how would they access that? Is that something you could put in the chat or? Or, yeah. or in the Google Doc, the Q and A, just as the final. <laughs> the URL for that in the Google Doc. It's the e testing task force meeting, and uh, uh, the URL is just a second. Yeah, yeah I, I'm putting it in the e four testing task. Force. Thank you, Samir, um, and thank you again, David. That was a great talk. Um, I know we have a few people still hanging out with us. Um, I just can't stress enough. Uh, we have a, a very, very short survey we'd love for you to take. Um, we're looking for feedback on this series, looking for additional topics that might be on your mind. Um, so we would like to collect feedback about this particular event, but as well as, you know, kind of what you would like to see in the future. Um, those uh, survey results are important to the people who pay us to do this. And so um, that's also another good reason to do that so that we can keep this series, um, you know, progressing. And um, just again, thank you, Samir and David, wonderful talk. And um, we appreciate uh, whoever diligently was answering all those questions in the document. <laughs> you did a great job. <laughs> Thanks. And I've put the URL for the Zoom uh, for the, the E4S uh, Zoom meeting, which is held every two weeks. Thank you, Summer. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Happy.